Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to Within's Continuing Education Webinar Provider Series. My name is Ashley Barkoviak, and I'm the Clinical Operations Coordinator here at Within Health. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our presenter today. Lori Brown is one of our registered dietitians here at Within Health. Lori has been a dietitian for over 20 years with over a decade of experience focusing on nutritional therapy. Lori has supported clients with eating disorders in partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, and outpatient levels of care. Lori provides individualized nutrition therapy rooted in intuitive eating, mindfulness, body trust, and self-compassion. She describes her approach as relational and curious. As an eating disorder specialist, her work life in assisting people to establish a healthy relationship with body and food. While in grad school, Lori studied meditation and completed research on the benefits of self-compassion practices for body image healing. Her passion for treating the whole person propelled her to complete the role and renew training in 2019, became a yoga teacher trainer in 2020, Judith Lasterts Relax and Renew Restorative Yoga in 2021, and an intensive Pilates training through the Pilates Center in 2024. Her focus in movement is on the connection creating safe spaces, and assisting people to find a place of ease. Lori attended Central Michigan University for her bachelor's degree and then went on to complete her master's degree in health education with an emphasis on eating disorder care at Plymouth State University. When Lori is not at work, you will most likely find her reading a book or playing in her garden. We're so excited to have Lori joining us today. Before we do kick things off, we do have some general things to go over for the CEU credits. I will now pass things over to Jamie Singletary, who will go over those credits. Thank you, Ashley, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are so happy that you are here. As Ashley mentioned, I just have a few housekeeping things that I would like to go over. As it pertains to your CE certificate, you will receive a link through your CEGO dashboard to complete an evaluation. Once you complete the evaluation, you will be given another link to download your certificate. So if you have to switch computers at any time or you have some technical issues, please feel free to email me. We will make sure that you receive your certificate. And I will also have my contact information in the chat. And while you are following along with the presentation, we have also uploaded some information that you can reference the talk with to your CEGO dashboard. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. And just to kind of reference as well, we will not be providing the slides today. The video of the presentation will be available afterwards. You will not get credit for just watching that video, though you do have to attend live today in order to receive get that credit. And again, as Jamie mentioned, please utilize your CEGO dashboard for all things CE related, whether that's rewatching the video or obtaining your certificate. And for any additional questions and concerns regarding obtaining the credit, again, like Jamie said, we'll provide our email as well as CEGO support email as well in the chat if you need to contact them. And if there are any questions that come up during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A session or use the chat and Jamie and I will be on the lookout for those. Thank you all. And we're so excited to have you present today, Lori. Well, thank you so much. It's um, really humbling and a unique experience to have such a generous um introduction. So I am really excited to be here. I want to just acknowledge if you see me shifting a little bit, I, I have a lot of fluids with me. So vocally, let's hope for the best. But if that's um, what you see, I just wanted to be really transparent. So thanks again for that introduction. Um, I am a person that I would say, first and foremost, I just love movement. I lean into creative forms of movement and have engaged in those for several years, and I am a strong team player. Um, I would hope that anybody that knows me understands how much I love to work as a team. And so I would say that in addition to being curious and compassionate, I love to do collaborative care. So we have a huge agenda. I just have so many thoughts and ideas and actually needed to like skim the presentation down. I'd like to say that this will be more of like an aerial viewpoint or an overview of movement because any one of these topics we probably could do um, an entire session on. So I will try and keep a pace. I can be a fast talker, but I'm gonna be really aware of my pace 
and we're going to talk about a lot. So we'll start just by looking at like the traditional overview of movement in an eating disorder space and maybe talk about some of the assumptions that we have made. We'll definitely be weaving research throughout our time. I have a couple of cases that I selected that I would like to present. Throughout our time, you will hear just the importance of working as a team. I'm really hopeful that you will find practical ideas to integrate movement into treatment. Above all, I'm hoping that um, clinicians that we feel empowered to have these conversations and we will absolutely ensure that there are boundaries around safety. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of an issue here with my um, ability to forward. So I'm gonna stop and try one more time, but Jamie, I might have to have you pop on and see if we can get through that. We'll try one more time. Hello. Okay, so uh, looking at just for today, I wanted to start because we're gonna be talking about movement and exercise. So these are just the way that I'm framing up the definitions, but certainly there's a theme when we start looking at movement versus exercise and physical fitness. There's not one standard definition if you look at research as it relates to eating disorder. So again, for the sake of today, when I'm talking about movement, it's going to be broad, just any movement that would utilize energy from the body. This could be informal and just part of our daily life. I talk about this a lot with clients, things like vacuuming and bringing in the groceries. It also might be a way that we're connecting with ourselves or with others. So I think about that gardening I like to do or hiking in nature. Exercise is probably more planned and structured. It's purposefully, purposefully engaging in physical activity. We could be engaging in this for a goal or for a result. Jamie, I'm just going to have you come on because it's continuing to jam on my side. I think just for time, let's make that transition. Sorry, everybody. No, no worries. Give me just a second to share. And, and I apologize because I will just for the audience to be aware, you'll just hear me say next slide pretty frequently, but we're just going to keep cruising. So if you want to go to the next slide, Jamie, we are ready to go. So I think of movement as like a continuum. And I wanna just thank Gillian Hood who made this for our movement psychoeducation group. I love this picture. We can see in this like pink red shade, how there could be movement that we might view as excessive or compulsive. And then kind of to the opposite side of the continuum is what we might consider avoidant when someone is engaged, disengaged or maybe even resistant with movement. So as we're conceptualizing movement and thinking about it as a continuum, starting to leave space for exploring what might be in between these two extremes. And so I think about intuitive movement or flexible movement, mindful movement. And you can see some other words there that, that might help conceptualize this. Next slide, please. So when we think about the continuum of movement, um, what stands out in my mind is like the pink and the green, those, those ends, we might consider that to be dysfunctional. The qualitative aspects of maladaptive exercise, such as distress with seizing exercise, obsessive thoughts, and exercising despite negative outcomes are more telling of pathological exercise. We know that dysfunctional exercise is not a new issue. We have history as old as 150 years that points as dysfunctional exercise as a core symptom. A really high percent of individuals with eating disorders, upwards to 85%, could be experiencing maladaptive exercise cognitions and or behaviors. And that's important for us to hold space that Yes, when we're assessing, we wanna think about behaviors, but the thought process is also really important. Next slide. So definition of dysfunctional exercise, 
You can see at the top there's sources, and these will all be included in a handout for you, but this is taken from C's. Dysfunctional exercise, vigorous exercise. It's probably the stereotype that we, we most typically think of. This is the really strenuous, high intensity. This might be the folks that are moving in spite of an injury. And we definitely have the most research around this type of dysfunctional exercise. Incidental physical activity or daily movement to me is really interesting for a few reasons. Um, culturally, this is promoted as health, healthy, helpful, and it really can be. And I feel like in recovery spaces, we often might start introducing these, these types of movements. So like walking, for example, if we can build assessment and curiosity into the equation, we might realize that even though someone is just walking, they're actually really thinking about it. And so it's this obsessive pattern of needing to park further away. Another area of dysfunctional exercise could be motor restlessness. This can be the very nature of having insufficient energy. And then we know that some of our clients carry other diagnoses. So we might see things like stemming, wiggling, pacing, and then obsessive thinking. We've already named this on the previous slide, but really normalizing that dysfunctional exercise can happen in the absence of engaging in exercise. This is where our clients are not moving, but their thoughts are constantly ruminating and thinking. So for example, they might be thinking about calories. Next slide, please. So going back to our continuum and conceptualizing this, if we're thinking about how do we move people to a more mindful movement, this might be a definition that we can offer to ourselves and to our clients. So it's used to rejuvenate the body versus exhausting or depleting. It enhances the mind-body connection and coordination rather than confusing or dysregulating the mind-body relationship. It alleviates mental and physical stress instead of contributing to and exasperating stress. It provides genuine enjoyment and pleasure, not something that causes pain or is dreaded. Next slide, please. So if you can bear with me, I know that this is a pretty long quote, but I, I think that this really brings into focus like our central theme that we're going to be exploring today. Clinicians have commonly prescribed exercise abstinence during treatment to prevent exercise serving as an obstacle for weight restoration. However, seizing exercise completely during treatment has been proposed as unrealistic and potentially detrimental to health, uh, health outcomes in the long run. Removing the opportunity to exercise might exasperate the lack of control patients already feel during treatment. And it can be difficult for health professionals to supervise or enforce exercise policies, leaving individuals engaging in covert activity. Individuals in treatment are left confused about what is considered normal or healthy levels of exercise and fear that engaging in movement after treatment might lead to relapse. Exercise should be addressed in treatment focusing on reducing the negative cognitions and behaviors that maintain compulsive exercise. Next. So whether we're clinicians or family members or just support systems, or maybe we ourselves are in recovery, I know that we could have a variety of people I wanted to challenge myself and us collectively to think about, well, how we might inadvertently harm. None of us are intentionally doing this, but when it comes to movement, there might be some themes to pay attention to. So I put an asterisk by this first one because I know that I, I have inadvertently done this. <clears throat> so being really careful with language that suggests that movement is earned by following the meal plan. I think as a dietitian, we're just like so passionate that our clients are nourishing themselves and rehabilitating. If we're not careful, we can inadvertently reinforce the dysfunctional exercise though, because the nature of dysfunctional exercise is that something has to be earned. So we wanna be careful that movement isn't like a dangling carrot that our, 
our clients earn if they do a good job with their meal plan. And I try and use language along the lines of like, your meal plan is to support the movement that you're wanting to do. We might not have psychoeducation in place. So just a really small amount or none at all. There might not be sufficient time for practicing movement. I think that there can be a lack of variety really frequently offered in recovery spaces. And then a lack of specificity using vague language. So I put these asterisks here because the story just is so ingrained in my brain. I was working with a client and um, I thought I was very clear and essentially was like, you know, you want to move. I hear that. Why don't we start with like a slow kind of relaxing, easy paced walk upwards to 20 minutes. Well, when the client came back in our next session, what she ended up doing was power walking up hills in the neighborhood and actually got a little bit dizzy during part of it, but didn't stop because in her framework, that was still a slow, easy walk. And I realized, oh my goodness, I was definitely not clear enough. My interpretation of slow and easy was vastly different than this client's. And then this, this next one, oh my goodness, as clinicians, we, we acquire the, the, the lens, the ability to kind of detect the eating disorder. Sometimes we are like detectives and we have these spidey senses and a lot of times they're right. They're a gift and we can, we can get in there and challenge the eating disorder and reminding ourselves to be careful with assumptions that, that movement is directly related to the eating disorder. It might not be. Next slide. So this uh, next picture is actually about me. I was trying to think about uh, a picture that might uh, bring this, th this to light a little bit more. And this is my one of my favorite snack combinations. I absolutely love raw cauliflower, specifically dipped in this brand of, of French onion dip. It's just where I live, this is what's available and I really like it. One of my favorites, as a matter of fact, recently I did a supportive breakfast and I brought a sandwich, chips in this combination and my client was like, what are you doing eating cauliflower and French dip in the morning? But it's just truly something that I like. So imagine if I, um, went into any level of eating disorder care that my cauliflower French onion combination would probably raise some eyebrows and would definitely, you know, be assessed. Now it might be that just for the nature of healing, maybe for more energy dense foods or even like less fiber in the gut, there could be like several reasons that I might have to put my combination on the back burner and I would hope that at some point in a level of treatment that this was reintegrated because it's something that I really enjoy. And I want us to think about that as we are navigating and exploring movement with our clients. Next slide. So thinking about why we would explore movement in an eating disorder recovery space, we know that dysfunctional exercise is one of the strongest predictors of eating disorder relapse. It's often the first presenting and last remaining symptom of an eating disorder. And I've really come to appreciate that with the clients that I work with. They, they don't even necessarily recognize that it was one of the first um, symptoms. The relationship between dysfunctional exercise and eating disorders is based on the quality not the quantity of activity, which goes back to those cognitions. We already normalize that a high percent of clients with eating disorder also have dysfunctional exercise patterns. Engaging in dysfunctional exercise with a eating disorder can contribute to harmful physical and physiological outcomes and poor um, performance for those in sports. And if compulsive exercise is not addressed, it could extend treatment duration as well as worsen the symptoms. Next slide. I think another important component of this conversation is just the severity and the high cost of treatment. 
we want to think about practical and cost effective interventions. Exercise has historically been overlooked as a potentially affordable intervention. Next. There's a lot of benefits of movement exercise. I'm, I'm confident that this isn't new information. We know that um, it's been shown extensively in research to be effective in prevention and treatment of many diagnoses. So you can see some that are listed there. And again, I don't think that this is new information. Next slide. But if we think about the benefits to the public at large and then layer in within an eating disorder treatment, you can see that the benefits are, are even more expansive. So in addition to what we might be used to, things like reduced dysfunctional exercise patterns, improvement in body image and self-esteem, decrease in shape and weight concerns. If someone's needing to weight restore, it actually can assist in body composition. So I'm just gonna leave that for one moment so you can take a peek at it. That's from the C's website and you can go access that as well. Next. This is taken from Dr. Brian Cook. Um, here it comes to all the dietitians. Nutritionally supported exercise. Nutritionally supported exercise is safe and may convey multiple benefits in individuals with eating disorder. So you can see the arrows, decreased um, exercise attitudes and behaviors, decreased drive for thinness, decreased bulimic symptoms, decreased body dissatisfaction. Again, it can be beneficial with weight restoration, increase in strength, most commonly measured by hand strength or overall muscle mass. It can assist with cardiac abnormalities that we might see with anorexia and improve quality of life. What I really appreciated about this particular piece of research was the encouragement of clinicians to explore how exercise is medicine in clients with eating disorder. I hadn't heard that before, and I, I really like that approach. Next. So I want to be clear that the goal today isn't to say that every single person that we're working with has to exercise. Exercise guidelines do not suggest that exercise is appropriate for all individuals with eating disorder. Rather, our suggested guidelines summarize recommendations and research evidence that may guide us as clinicians in examining how to tailor the health benefits of appropriate exercise. Next. So this is how I conceptualize um, our conversation thus far. We've looked at early treatment and historically it was an abstinence-based approach. And then as more options began to be offered for treatment, you can see some of the levels there. Um, it might be limited movements, for example, supervised or mindful walks. Our current treatment options, um, you can see that the most common methods in research that I, that I have found is yoga, walking, stretch, and resistance bands. There's a lack of clarity. So like yoga can mean a lot of different things. And I did not find that there was a standard definition but those are types. Then I did see reference to strength training, to sports, and to recreational games as well. So maybe a next step or for us to think about is how we tailor and individualize our treatment and really normalize movement as a whole, normalize relearning about movement and our relationship with movement, and normalize reconditioning. Next slide. So we're going to look at some evidence-based tools that could inform us as clinicians. Next. The first one we'll take a peek at is the SEEDS. Um, this was developed, I was peeking at my notes. Yes, this was developed in 2000 and 2011. The Safe Exercise at Every Stage guideline was developed to facilitate clinical decision-making related to safe exercise. And um, they took guidelines and paired it with experts in the field. Um, next. So um, a couple things. First of all, you can download this. This is available on their website if this is helpful to you. But across the top, you can see that there is this progression with nutritional plan. 
It's not intended to be linear. We normalize that clients might be going kind of up and down with a nutrition plan, but it does build in some guidelines about how frequently to assess based on that. And then there's a lot of medical considerations which immediately point to having a team in place. Next. And then once we have categorized our clients to that level A, B, et cetera, you can see that it, it defines for us the intensity, the duration, the type, and if there's like any specific accommodations or considerations in the type, if it's to be supervised or not, and then education. And I really appreciate that there's education at every level really leaning into psychoeducation as a component and part of our movement relationship. Next. So part of um, the C's, if that is helpful and you're wanting to learn about this, I just wanna mention that there are metabolic equivalents that they reference as the assessment. And so what that means is that's the ratio of the work metabolic rate to the resting metabolic rate. I find this really helpful to me as a um, dietitian. It can be beneficial when I'm thinking about meal plan and if they're nutritionally supported to engage in this movement. Um, I've also found it really helpful just to brainstorm ideas if I feel stuck because there is an extensive amount of movements that are listed next. So um, the, con the compendium of physical activities is connected to this and what this is, this came out, I think, like in, in the 1980s or 1990, and they've been updating it. But you can see that there's these categories of physical activity or movement. The most recent edition did come out in 2024, and they added video games as a category. Next. So the compendium of physical activities, it's this comprehensive list of activities that show the metabolic equivalent. So um, you can see this is a screenshot of home activities, and then you see those numbers like 1.8 for ironing, 1.3 for knitting. Those numbers are the METs. So for our clients, even like home activities, they're like, I don't do anything. I'm not moving. But we can see that something like making a bed is a metabolic equivalent of a 3.0. Moving furniture around is a metabolic equivalent of 5.8. So it can be helpful for us and also to reframe things. Next. This is just an example uh, to remind me <laughs> that you have in your handouts um, a like common exercises with the metabolic equivalents that sync up with the seeds. So like a client level A, level B, et cetera. And so it is not all inclusive. If you want that, go out to the compendium of physical activity. Uh, I did not mention that they have adults and then they have clients that are in wheelchairs. So there's different lists that are out there. Okay, let's go to the next. So we talked about seeds and how that could be a, a tool for our team to be continually assessing. Another tool that has a lot of research and can be helpful is the REDS. So relative energy deficiency um, in sports, this syndrome refers to impaired a physiological functioning caused by relative energy deficiency and includes, but, it's not, but is not limited to impairments of metabolic rate, menstrual function, bone health, immunity, protein synthesis, and cardiovascular health. Again, this is a great tool that helps us with um, screening and assessing, and then we can determine the risk level and make a treatment plan. Next. Okay, so this picture just, I really appreciate the visual moment to understand how impactful low energy availability is. And this is in the context of sports and also for clients that we work with. You can see that pretty much every major system is really impacted. Next. And then in the next, we'll just see how engaging in physical movement or sport is specifically impacted 
by low energy availability. So no surprise, but sometimes to, to people, this is really surprising. Like, man, I am really struggling, um, whether they're weightlifting or running, they feel like their goals, that they're not achieving them. They're really tired. They're burned out. They can't concentrate. And so this can just be a visual reference for us as well as for clients if they're experiencing any of these symptoms. Next. So um, this was designed for the use by, um, to use to assess F athlete health and performance teams, typically led by a physician. You can get this if this is of interest. For time and ease, what happens is that clients are given these risk factors. So you might be able to see in that small print that there's primary and secondary risk indicators. And in the full version of this, which is included in your resources, it actually lists what those are. And so through the assessment you'll be going through, or the physician would be going through, tallying up the risk factors and then categorizing someone. So green, in this case, means that there's not really any risk that's standing out that would hold someone back from engaging in movement. Red is going to be much more acute. Maybe those clinical cases that we've had <clears throat> where they have several clinical criteria and their movement needs to be paused. I don't use this as often as C's. And when I do, because sometimes I do, I would just say coincidentally, <laughs> clinically, anecdotally, I have several like orange clients and I have used it just to explain to parents or clients like, hey, I'm not taking movement away, but it does need to be modified until we can get some of this criteria contained so that we can have no restrictions. Next. So some perspectives that are helpful to talk about with our clients and to be assessing these are categorized built categories built within the compulsive exercise test. What I love about this, um, the compulsive exercise test, is that it's reliable, it's repeatable, it's not super time consuming for clients to do. And for me as a clinician, knowing these categories and where their scores came can can inform my conversations and approach. So someone that is struggling with movement from an avoidance posture versus using it as a tool for mood improvement versus weight control, those might be different exposures and interventions and conversations, and it will score and we can interpret that. Next slide. So those are the categories again. I kind of highlighted the compulsive exercise test. Let's go to the next one. We will look at, this is not the whole test, but it's part of the test, but you can see it's like a light cart scale. And so our clients would be going through this, answering never true, rarely true, sometimes true, et cetera, scoring it. And then we as clinicians would excuse me, they would just go through it, hand it to us, and we would score it. And then we can interpret that with our clients. Next. Now, I recognize that some of us, maybe just time or what's available, we might not have these tools. Um, informal assessment can be really illuminating. This first question, in my opinion, I can get a lot of information, which is just tell me about your relationship with movement. There are a couple other conversation starters that are included here. And then again, in your handouts, there's several questions for you as a clinician and or for you to um, talk about with your clients. Next. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about case studies. You can go to the next one. Um, I wanted to bring so many, but for the sake of time, I only brought two. So um, these are real uh, cases that we have been able to explore movement here at Within. This first client, client A, was an early middle-aged cis female and she completed 30 weeks of treatment. 
This was her first time in formal eating disorder treatment. She actually had the diagnosis for a really significant amount of time, but just with the, the demands of her career in her collegiate coursework, she was never able to go to residential as it was suggested. You can see the BMI when this client came to us and go ahead and peek at some of the other diagnoses. Several, several diagnoses. Next. In terms of movement, she had danced most of her life, actually through college as well. When this client started our program, she was living in a major city. So there were just functional, practical elements of movement. And also movement had become her primary way to manage her anxiety. So when I first met this client for an assessment, her movement goal was to be able to move normally. Next. So you'll see kind of considerations in how I'm conceptualizing these case studies nutritionally, medically, therapeutically. Um, our first goal absolutely was stabilization, as you can imagine. And then once we were able to get through that phase, we really stepped into a very intentional restorative meal plan that lasted for several weeks. And then once we um, were able to arrive, we started slowly titrating and we went more into like a sufficiency plan. And we're, we were able to talk just a little bit about intuitive eating Medical uh, considerations, the nurse on this team, uh, oh my goodness, worked tirelessly and just was a champion of coordination of care. Stabilization was our first primary intervention and just countless phone calls and um, appointments and following up. She did such a beautiful job making sure that we were all on the same page. A lot of medical management using the outpatient providers. Therapeutically, stabilization, function of the eating disorder, relational patterns. Next. In terms of movement, uh, this client came in walking an exorbitant amount, well over 20,000 steps per day, and she was tracking them. Uh, it just wasn't feasible in, in the setting such as remote, and I don't know that it would have been realistic for a variety of reasons for this client just to stop movement. And so we met her where she was at and really started to titrate. So as the meal plan was going up, we were titrating the movement down. Uh, initially, she did count steps. Once she got down to about 4,000 steps, we came up with different ways of kind of being aware of movement to get the tracker off. And then um, we emphasized functional movement, for example, walking to the grocery store. And then near the end of treatment, we did experiences where we were formally reintroducing movement, for example, Pilates. Home considerations, just knowing what's a typical day like for this person and who are the supports. And then again, you can see some, there was actually more team members, um, but just some of the, the providers that were part of this case. And it was extensive case consultation and coordination of care. Next. These are just a few examples um, of reflections and experientials. A couple that stand out to me is uh, this client planted an herb garden for one of their experiences. Uh, as, she, as she progressed, she went roller skating with her partner and then had dessert. So just creative ways that you can be weaving movement thoughts and movement experiences into their day. Next. Um, I am happy to say about client A that when she left our program, she had restored over 30 pounds. She was on a um, meal plan that, that she was tolerating and her relationship with movement had really drastically changed. Client B, early middle-aged uh, cis female, completed 10 weeks of treatment, BMI at admission greater than 30, you can see some of the other diagnoses that this client carried as well. Next. This client didn't really speak of an extensive movement history, kind of the typical activities of daily living. Her goal was to increase mobility and decrease pain. And then she had a personal goal to be able to walk through the grocery store without getting out of breath. Next. I wanna highlight case conceptualization that these are really similar, even though they had different diagnoses, different body types from a 
from a case consideration perspective, there was a lot of similarity. So nutrition considerations first was stabilization and then sufficiency. And she was able to work quite a bit on intuitive eating with her dietitian. <clears throat> medical considerations, you can see those. And the nurse was involved in making sure that this client was um, connected outpatient wise. Therapeutically, the same exact ones, stabilization, function of eating disorder, relational patterns, next. In regards to movement, uh, this client was able to start with functional movement and working on increased mobility because of the client's goals and the level of pain, uh, physical therapy was brought into the case and the client went to physical therapy. In terms of home considerations, it was really helpful. The dietitian worked with the client to create like a plan to make sure that the client was doing those PT exercises. And then the outpatient team and coordination of care was, was still a really active part of this case. And you can see that there. Next. Um, I didn't have time to do other cases. I teach yoga and I teach Pilates. <laughs> These are just client stories. I love this one. Um, this client told me how annoyed she was. <clears throat> I was annoyed that my team placed me in this group. I thought it would be too easy, but I think I needed this more than I realized. This is the first time my chest has felt this way. And this client was actually emotional when she told me this. <clears throat> Next. This is from a client Pilates. In some ways, this group is really hard, but I enjoy trying to focus on my body from an anatomical perspective. And I always feel better at the end than when I started. Next. So let's go into some practical ideas. Next. You can see some examples if we're wanting to integrate movement into treatment some areas for us to focus on. First and foremost, we we need to ensure that, that this is safe and that we have a system in place that it remains safe. So having a team in place where medical evaluation and reevaluation re can continue. It's super important to know the client's goals. Like, do they even want to move? Is the movement part of the eating disorder? I love creating uh, vision boards with clients, movement vision boards, or just some type of a plan so that they understand what it is that we're going to be doing in treatment. Identifying the support systems and if they're needing to be supervised, who's going to be doing that? Are we going to be doing that as a friend, as a family member? Again, teamwork is so important. Having specific guidelines, particularly when we are first reintroducing or starting that movement, being very clear on the intensity, the duration, the type, and also the setting. I think it's exceedingly important that our clients have psychoeducation first and throughout the movement process. I like to set an expectation that if we're going to be moving, we're going to be processing and that I'm asking clients to be, you know, bringing this content back to sessions with me and their therapist. We can create individualized assignments and it might be if time allows or it works in our um, approach, we could actually support them with movement in our session. Next. So additional safety considerations, the length the setting, are they supported or going alone? I think it's so important that we make sure our clients have realistic expectations. What might feel, I think to me, what I've learned and keep relearning is, is what feels um, maybe obvious or normal to me, it's very beneficial to go slow and review many times. And so realistic expectations is one that stands out in my mind to continue revisiting that this is going to take some time and are we being kind and realistic in what we're asking of the body. There's practical things just to make sure that we have the gear and equipment nutritionally stabilized, including hydration. Um, I like for my clients, particularly younger clients, that they have location settings on so their parents or support system know where they're at if they are alone at the same time that they um, are turning tracking features off, that we have practiced and repracticed and practice again listening to the body and that we have normalized that we need to practice in this reconditioning phase.
next. This is the top test. I, I just think this is a fantastic tool. It's portable. It's not super socially awkward to do out and about. Um, it's affordable. Uh, you can see the categories where it's rated low to maximum. I told you the story of a client I worked with on a low walk and they really were probably very high. <clears throat> what I like about this is we can practice this with clients. We can describe low and then we could even if we wanted to have them like march in place for a few minutes and practice a talk test so that they can start feeling and hearing what maybe a moderate is. To me, it's very clear. I normally have clients do like a favorite song, a favorite poem, something that they can easily recall. And then um, I have them practice this when they are first reintroducing movement that they're stopping at a frequency that I determined to do their talk test. Next. So here's just a few examples. There's probably thousands and thousands of ways that we could create movement experientials. And this is where it gets kind of fun because as you get to know the clients and what's important to them, you can be super creative. And honestly, the clients can come up with a lot of these ideas, which is so empowering. Next. These are examples of um, psychoeducational suggestions. This comes from Dr. Cook's article. So I'm gonna let you peek at this really quickly. These are broad categories and it's suggested that all of these are reviewed with our clients while they are exploring their relationship with moving. Next. So the next slide are actually ways that we have broken them down. Myself and a therapist co-lead a movement process group every week. And so these are kind of subcategories under those general ones. We have a few others, but I just wanted to give like actual examples, maybe in language that felt a little bit more relatable of some of the topics that we are talking about. I found this group to be really engaged. People are, are having these conversations about movement. Next. Um, barriers. I think that when we go back to the continuum and we normalize one, one part of the equation might be people who avoid movement and we want to be really sensitive to assess like what's getting in the way. Many of our clients could have been teased. Movement could have been used as a way of pressure or punishment. I can't tell you how many times clients have had light bulb moments when I ask, well, who, who selected that you do that? Definitely diet mentality, the rigid thinking, time is is a very big barrier. Um, weather, do they even have safe access? Is there some confidence issues? What are the conditions? Um, access, we talked about. Fear, oh my goodness, I have really sat with so many people who historically were compulsive movers and are so afraid that if they start moving, they will not be able to stop. It's like a Pandora's box to them and they're just avoiding it. Like just terrified to start movement. And of course, comparison could be a barrier and then lack of awareness. Next. I think as clinicians, we have many barriers. I was talking to my colleagues, dietitians, and um, a big one for us is just time. It just feels like these sessions go so fast. You're like, oh my goodness, I wasn't able to talk about movement. Coordination of care. Who is going to be addressing this? Who is going to be updating kind of who's driving this in our team? Some people just feel really intimidated. Like I, I didn't go to school for that. And so it can be overwhelming. We have clients who are really acute that are in our care and that can be a barrier. Other diagnoses, I think of like POTS and diabetes. If we don't have clear guidelines, if they are approved to move and what that might look like, that could be a barrier accessibility for our clients can be a very large barrier. And then many times other focus areas are just taking priority in the treatment stay when they are with us. Next. So this is um, some of the levels of movement. And I just wanted to point out that in our levels, we do normalize that conversation piece. Again, I think that it's accessible and helpful for people to start paying attention to their ability to stay engaged in a conversation as it relates to intensity and movement. Next. Here are some of the groups that we offer. Yoga, 
breathing and stretching, emotion, which is like a creative movement, Pilates, strength training, and then again, that psychoeducation group next. Before we wrap up, I do just want to say if you are leading movement experiences, um, first and foremost, humans come in many shapes and sizes, so cueing appropriately and having modifications for different types of bodies. Um, being aware that our clients carry other diagnoses so that we have a plan in place. Many clients have trauma. The most, uh, I guess, common example that comes to my mind is like breath work. We might think that that's really helpful, but for many people, it's actually quite activating. So just having informed um, approaches and invitational cues so that our clients always feel empowered to take care of themselves I, again, I think role modeling a talk test and normalizing that is really helpful. We definitely want to make sure that we have a safety plan in place, that we know what to do if something happens. And we cannot be all things to everybody. So just knowing when and who to refer to. Next. So as we wrap up, um, I just, I want to thank you for your time. I would say movement is a normal part of life. Movement and exercise can both be really important aspects to to um, explore in recovery spaces. Keep it simple. Just get the conversation started. Work as a team. Be clear who's managing and driving these recommendations. Know your limits and scope. It is possible that clients might be able to move earlier than what we once normalized in treatment. Support is integral for introducing movement and movement's optional, not mandatory. So that is it. Um, there, there are resources and then there's also references and just some tools that might be helpful to you in the handouts. So you can take at those. Yeah, Ashley, thank you. Thank you, Lori. And I know that was such a great presentation. And I want to say that to you. And thank you for sharing in this space and, and for providing all this great info today. And you're getting some love in the chat. So make sure you check out that. Um, we do have a little bit of time for Q&A. So we have some questions. So the first question that we have is, do you have one group or modality of movement you recommend for more acute clients? Yeah. Um, yes. And, you know, I think as clinicians, we're trying to keep things individualized as, as best as we're able. And so I would, I would empower us to have conversations and to be creative. But I would say something that's on your handout, it's not in the compendulum of activities, but it's in your handout. I added it and there's an asterisk, but myofascial release, it it could be activating and challenging for clients. It hasn't happened yet when I have done that with people, but it's essentially where you have these like self-massage uh, props and balls and they are connecting to different muscles on their body. And the most common experience that I have had with people is just like, um, I'm a big fan of spine twisting too. So as long as they don't carry a diagnose where they're not allowed to twist, um, that can feel really good to a lot of people. Yeah, thank you so much. And we did have a question come through the chat as well. I'm just asking about if you would recommend um, these types of groups for higher level, higher level of care folks that are here at Within. Yeah, I think if I understand the question, like maybe higher acute. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm gonna, yeah, that's how I'm going to answer the question. But if if not, clarify. So uh, if you look at the C's, and again, I use that most frequently, but you could look at the reds. Um, what stands out in my mind is that there are cases where no movement is suggested and clients can be pretty acute and still move. So the most common um, examples that step in my mind and again, without knowing all the information, but that in C's level A, which is our most acute clients, they are approved for up to 30 minutes, up to a METS of a 3.0. So like a Pilates intro level mat could potentially be, we don't do that here at Within, but it could potentially be um, walking, 
So if you look at the compendulum of physical activities, you might be surprised at the amount of different types of movement that clients could, but again, they need to be medically cleared. And there's considerations at that level of like their head position from an orthostatic perspective. So I, I hope I answered that. Thank you so much, Lori. We have some more questions just to be wrap up Q and A. Um, how do you personally coordinate um, with teams here at Within Health? Well, I, I'm really fortunate because we do have a huge team here at Within. And so um, I have to give a shout out to our nurses. They're incredible. And they drive a lot of that medical assessment so that we can be determining, are they appropriate? And then dietitians are kind of tailoring the, the plans. And at the same time, there's a lot of outpatient providers. If you remember in client A that I referred, um, we needed to work really closely with the GI doctor, with the physical therapist. There was several other specialists that we were also speaking with. So I think internally, if we have that, if we're working in a setting where we have that team approach, that's great. And for many of us, we're probably going to have to form it at an outpatient level. At a minimum, dietitian, therapist, medical provider. And when we start talking about um, movement, I think like movement providers that um, have safe language is really important. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. We did have another question just roll through as well. Um, just asking your opinions on like step trackers, Apple watches, Fitbits, and what kind of challenges you see. Um, like if there's like a step challenge, um, your thoughts on that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Like, do I see it as challenging for my clients? Yeah. I think it's like, what are your thoughts on the step challenges on devices such as Fitbits, Apple watches, that yes, kind of, I think I have it now. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. I think this leads into a lot, like a larger conversation, but where for our clients, I think what comes up is like, how come I can't do it? everybody else is doing this. And so without knowing more, I think my general answer would be like, oh, for most of the clients I've worked with, steps are not neutral in the sense that numbers are not neutral. We can get really fixated and hyper-focused and my specialty is in eating disorder. I, I cannot say if it's appropriate for that client's neighbor or sister or whoever else, but it's typically not neutral. I I typically ask clients to not use those, but at the same time, I already mentioned in um, client A for a season, we just used what she was already using, which was a step tracker until we could get to a place where having other approaches was, was realistic. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I know like that is something that um, we appreciate you sharing because I know that's something that's really prevalent um, that's going on today. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more quick question. Um, what ideas do you have for a client that is not willing to stop moving? Oh, oh goodness. I think therapeutic presence and relationship is really important if we can build that at all, because that's a hard one. Um, in an ideal world, we can get curious, like, why not? If our medical assessment is thorough is there any way that we can meet them where they're at and titrate them? I mean, there are definitely times where people have to stop moving. And if there's any way that we can work with them towards a goal versus coming in and just like totally stopping something, I would give that a go. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lori. And we're just going to wrap things up. And again, I want to thank you all for sharing in this space today and thank Lori for such a wonderful presentation. Again, please check out the chat because you're getting some really wonderful love for how well you did here. Um, something that I do want to let all of you know as well, we will have some exciting events coming up within the new year. So please keep an eye on all our social media platforms um, as well as our website because all of that great stuff will come in for our provider series that we always host every year. And we're excited for 2025 to have wonderful presentations just as we had Lori's today. And we're so excited to share this space with you all year after year. And thank you all again. Thank you, Lori, for such a great presentation and for Jamie for providing support today. Yes. Thanks, all. Jamie. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. We appreciate thank it. You. And for those of you that hopped on maybe a couple minutes after announcements, if you need any assistance with obtaining your CE certificate, 
please feel free to reach out to me directly, but you can go to your CEGO dashboard and you will have all the information that you need. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, all.